You're watching Face to Face. I'm your host, Tim Vince, and I am delighted to be joined by barrister Paul Diamond. Is that a good title? Yeah, that's the one I've got. And we've known each other for 20 odd years, I yep. think maybe slightly less, Paul. Yeah. And I, I, I don't know how to introduce you because you've been so prolific on so many uh, fronts at the front line. I, I would say of the culture wars, yeah. uh, but obviously you've got a much broader experience in, in the legal realm. Uh, and I would like to go into some of the detail of that, uh, yeah. especially the rule of law, because it niggles me yeah. <laughs> what that actually means. But yeah. I thought before we start, Paul, uh, on that, uh, tell us a little bit about the Paul Diamond's Christian faith. Ah, oh, that's a good question, of course, yes. Tim. Um, just to say, I want to say how I'm very flattered to be on your show. I want to say that. It's a great honour for me. And um, um, I hope people find the little I've done interesting, if I could put it that way. Um, yes, well, I've been a Christian since I was 19. So I'm a bit sort of, um, that was in, uh, I'll give my age away, that was in 1980. So. Um, I beat you by one year. Right, well. 79 was my year. Well, it's a bit embarrassing, isn't it? Because we should be incredibly developed Christians and we should be have everything sussed, but you know. I, th I, th I sometimes look back on my past when I was about 25 and knew absolutely everything. It was absolutely sort of, you know, much more sort of black and white in my thinking. Mm. But um, so, yes, I've, so I was at Bridge Lane Chapel in wow. Temple Fortune, if that means anything yes. to anybody. And I think the thing that struck me, strikes me about it, there were three elders of the church mm. and one... Yes, Led better. I was going to say... How do I know everyone? But how do you know everyone? He was a lovely brother. He was the father-in-law of my old headmaster. Keep going. Yeah, <laughs> I think he mentioned mm. um, his daughter had worked yeah. in a school. Yes, yes no, no, it's John Lidbetter. And he yeah. became my... I was going to actually mention that name specifically. How wonderful. And he was, he was sort of the figure for me. And there was another chap called Morris Bowler. Mm. And... Um, he was 80 then, so he was born in 1900, and he died at 96 That's in right. 1996. I attended his funeral. Yeah. Wow, wow. Well, I, think, I, I think I might have even... Wow, well, we don't need to talk about no. law, lawfare and things no. like that. No, what a dear man. I watched him, I was sitting with him and watched uh, Botham do his double century. Do you remember when Botham were back yeah. at the double century? I yeah, was, yeah. I was sitting down with John Ledbetter. Right. Uh, well, I mean, yeah. I was going to mention, I mean, the thing that struck me about that church way back in mm. 1980 was the uprightness of it. Yes. Um, the absolute high standards, no questions were asked at, over the leadership. You know, if 5P went missing, they'd probably sort of be an inquiry or yes. something. Very high standards. Mm. and. It's something I haven't felt for a very long time in the church. Not trying to be mean, because I know there are yeah. lots of good people in it, but that collectively unquestioning... Yeah. Probity. Probity, absolute integrity, you know, self-sacrifice as a second nature. Yeah. Um, it's something I remember very much, mm. and you felt very secure in it because you knew there was a structure and, and you know and didn't they know their bibles in those they days they did know I their think bibles came from a brethren background yes. they they knew their bibles inside out so that would intimidate you even more it did intimidate you even more but they were also very loving and they mm. always used to go around to john and jones for tea and yes. chat you yes. know so that's amazing that you know yes and that's absolutely I, I i can't defeat tim no matter what <laughs> i do you know i've been trying for 20 years but there isn't a person in jerusalem or, or london he doesn't know you know and um, and paul you've you've been such a great support to so many christians over over the years and i've um, known various cases. We don't have to go into all, no. the, all the details because we'll be here, you know, 20, more than 27 minutes. But something that's niggled me mm. over, over the years is, is this veneration of the rule of law. And if mm. I could just give you a little a bit of background, that, that, as I remember it, there was a Thomas Bingham, who was yes. master of the roles and, yes. you know, Lord Chief Justice or something. Who, who wrote a book on the rule of yes. law. And I remember him talking about it and saying, 
The rule of law is the nearest thing we have to a universal secular religion. And that scares the boots off me. What do they mean by that? Well, it scares the boots off me. Um, I think, I mean, there's a, there's a collective loss of direction in society and, and something very tedious has happened. I, I think we're from slightly previous generation. Politics is for the politicians. Teaching is for teachers. Law is for lawyers. People had some sense of limitation and limitation of human nature. Now there's this, I can't really describe it, but this utopian idea. The teachers aren't teaching. They're going to create the new Soviet citizen yes. who's totally engaged. Lawyers aren't doing a legal case. They're creating the just and ultimate society. And the only people that aren't properly doing their job are politicians. And the judges have got terribly powerful. I mean, um, the courts are um, a very important part of the state. And it's, it's kind of difficult without being a sort of going into too much detail. Yeah. I'm not sure I could articulate sure. it all. Yeah. But there is, there is this division, as we've had in the West, legislature, executive, judiciary. And the judiciary is actually the sort of the pauper's box. It's very important. Actually, they created many of the freedoms through the common law we take. But they're undemocratic. They're not elected. They come from a sort of very closed school of thinking. And their reserve power is very limited. I mean, they, they, there's been moments of great judicial history, mm. sort of, case of proclamations in 1608 yeah. where the court said the king can no longer rule by proclamation. He just used to announce the law. He had to pass it through Parliament and you had to have some, you know, obviously society enabled that, but these great moments of history. But the courts are way out of their league now. Um, the Americans mockingly call them the philosopher judge. And if you want to see someone who's neither a judge nor a philosopher, witness a philosopher judge. Mm. Uh, where they, and human rights, of course, has given them tremendous power. And I think with the collapse of other elements of society, because, you know, general, you know, non-Christian, lower standard of ethics in society, yeah. We don't trust the media anymore. It's, yeah. it's seen for what yeah. it is, I'm afraid. Just on, on the point about the law, interrupting mm. you, as I promised I would. Yeah. Um, a Jonathan Sumption, who was the Supreme Court mm. Justice, he, he gave the Reith lectures on this subject of the rise of law. And, I, I, you know, the general hint was it's got out of control. Yeah, and I think it totally is out of control. And the judges are out of control on it. I think what I was saying was they're the only respected branch left. See, the trouble is the government's collapsed and the antics yeah. of the last few years is, you know, no one knows where to turn. Parliament, I'm sure there are many fine members of Parliament and members of the government. The, the fourth estate, as I said, the media is, I don't think people believe a word half of what they say now. And so the judiciary has somehow still got this authoritative position um, I hate to say it's it. It's dangerous because well, they're sinful, fallen well, human beings. Well, I was going to say, I hate to say it, it's not really deserved. I mean, if you yeah. know them as individuals, I'm not trying to knock yeah, them, no. they're human beings like the rest yeah. of us. And the courts, I've sometimes wondered if they're players or adjudicators or what they are at times in some of my hearings. Um, but they've still got some authority left. And I think there's still a fleeting, but I think it is being diminished, belief you could get some form of justice, not from the government, not from the media, they won't cover it if you're unpopular, but from the courts. And I'm not sure how well placed it is. What, what I would say is though, is that the institution of the judiciary um, is basically the institutions created by the Victorians in many ways and historically, have outstood the weakness of the individuals who occupy positions within it. Um, it's, it's not to say, though, you know, it's a, it's a complex picture in yeah, all these is, sectors. And I'm just, yeah. I'm just a sort, yeah. sort, sort of punter. But the, um, the problem I've got with the rule of law is when laws 
which of course the judges have to enforce, or however the, the, the terminology mm. is, that laws are so hostile to the Christian faith and to just the basic Christian traditions uh, and anti-God. Yeah. And, and Peter and John before the Sanhedrin said, look, we have to choose who we obey, God or man. And, and some Christians are put into that position. And that shouldn't, that shouldn't be how law well, has become when you no. think Magna Carta. Carter. Well, I sort of, you know, I, I actually get, I mean, I've been doing these cases for a long time and actually it, it was quite a long game. You had to sort of get one dissent so you sort of lost two one and then you yeah. then you had to appeal the two one and get sort of one and a half to one and a half which mm. i believe you i've got that i've got three judges yeah. three ways and it's it's a process and people come up to you and go well how could the courts do that and why didn't they do that why didn't they save the country well first they can't but secondly the courts are part of the country they're not actually when they rule from a Christian point of view on abortion or something like that and the Christian feels it's a very bad judgment. Mm. The courts are part of our society. We are a cheap, I'm afraid to say, not very high standard, not very ethical, not much to say to the world, country Britain. Sadly. Sadly we are. It wasn't uh, so. It wasn't so and so the judges are part of that. They're not some kind of 18th century orthodox Christian model that somehow doesn't come from our society. So a mm. lot of the criticisms of the court, why did the European court decide that? How could they abolish our understanding of whatever it was, some Christian doctrine, or how could they abolish Sunday working and resting? Mm. Well, actually, it would have happened anyway, with or without the courts, because that's what we are. Yeah. And so that's a trend, it's a social, cultural trend, and they're part of that tide. Yeah, and I think the most the court... Can the tide turn, it would be a question I would throw out. Can, mm -hmm. can, it, can it, people, especially the younger generation, wake up and say, this is crackpot? Yeah, you know, I, 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 think, I think it can obviously change, and yeah. I think that's the Christian hope, that yeah. we, we, we're going to change and we mm -hmm. will change. Mm -hmm. And I think that we've got to sort of miss the tendency of saying, yes, it was better. I, I always remember my father telling me once when I was sort of bemoaning some minor setback. He said, you, you're something in the court case when he was still alive. And I remember he said to him something like, you've got no idea. We were fighting Hitler and Stalin and America was neutral when my father yeah. served in the RAF. Yeah. And um, you've so, got no idea what, yeah. what every day you wanted if you were going to live, let alone some... And you were rationed. You know, yeah, you, you, yeah. yeah. There, there was some sort of some silly court of appeal judge haranguing me and I was upset about that, you know, as I went but out. We do my, yeah. still have all the things that we say we're losing. We still do have freedom of speech because you're on the channel. Um, we still um, have, you know, freedom of assembly. Well, we like do that. and we don't. I mean, um, freedom of speech has been going for a very long time long time. I mean, the, the trouble with the concepts are um, we're sort of reduced, if I may put it boldly, to sort of Putin's level of freedom of speech. You, you can do a demonstration, you can stand on a soapbox in central Moscow, and I think the Russians would accord freedom of speech to that. And we've got very similar. The problem arises in the culture of freedom of speech. Would it be reported in the mass media? Would you be given a fair hearing? Um, would you suffer a detriment? Would you lose your job? Would you be subject to appropriation by your colleagues? Yeah. Uh, would you be classified as someone beyond the pale? And of course, all these things inhibit the culture of freedom of speech. Yeah. And unfortunately, um, the sort of the sort of I think it was Voltaire. Um, I defend the right. That's right, Voltaire. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, I'll defend the right to the death for your freedom I'll of speech. I'll fight to the death for you to. Uh, and and unfortunately, me. we've sort of, yes, we've sort of reached the stage, I'll fight to the death, but then you better die. Yes. Um, yeah. It's sort of, you can't say it. And, it, it, and people are so um, undeveloped in this field, they just, provided my side wins this debate, fair or foul, mm. that's a good outcome. Mm. And actually, it's playing by the rules, not the outcome, which I've learned over the years is equally important. Um, to lose the rules is to lose 
um, the structure. Mm -hmm. And once you've lost the structure, you're very little different from the people yeah. you spend most of your time criticizing. So work on changing the rules. Sorry, <coughs> changing them back. But then you've got to go to a dysfunctional parliament to try and achieve that. Well, it's part of society, and I think there's a lot of fear in society now, and <coughs> people aren't standing up, and they are, you know, I can understand they're not standing up because mm. they're treated brutally, mm. um, and there is a long way to haul it back, but people are very troublesome mm. Um, mm. to rulers because they don't always do as they're told, and, yeah. and I think there's a number of, you know, there are a number of structural problems in England, so it's not... Uh, probably sort of, I'm not even sure I'm being coherent, but there's yeah. been a hollowing out of the middle class since probably yeah. the 1980s. Yeah. Um, there's, a, there's a lot of people who can't get a home and safe job and they're actually highly qualified. So there's, there's a number of but, structural but, problems but behind also the law. But also the state has grown. So ev and if the state decides you have to comply with, let's say, the public sector equality duty or you won't get a job and when... Yeah. That's what, you and won't that, get a job. No, well, the state is absolutely outrageous at the moment. They can, I mean, we're, I mean, for what it's worth, we're meant to have a conservative government, but the state controls lots of employments. They control the schools. We know what they're teaching in the mm. schools. We know if you object to what they're teaching at the schools, they'll sack the teacher. We, they control housing estates. They're a landlord. We know they got. You have to behave according to their, what they say. You they behave like. Yeah, they, they could, could, well, banks are private entities, okay. but... Large shareholdings. Large share, well, they can pass a law. I mean, you know, they wouldn't, they wouldn't allow, they wouldn't allow a bank to shut a homosexual's bank account because yeah. he was, they disliked, the, they wouldn't allow that. That would be an outrage and it'd be, yeah. it'd be stopped in 24 hours. Yes. But uh, they seem to stumble along at a very snail-like pace when it's something they're not too bothered about. Yeah, exactly. And I think that's the problem is that, if your side wins, that people are quite um, pleased, fair or foul, they don't realise once they, I used to do a lot of cases on Christian free speech, once they sucked down Christian free speech, that's why we've entered the, that happened when I did these cases 10, 15 years yeah, ago. Yeah. And, I, and they were going, oh, these Christians shouldn't be speaking about abortion or marriage or, thank goodness they're being kept quiet. And now you've got it everywhere because it naturally expanded, you know, thus far and no further is, is not an accurate um, line to And there, there is a kind of, I know it's dysfunctional, but there, there seems to be a kind of pushback. Uh, you know, we, uh, of course, we're still restricted by, you know, how much we can say about certain things, but there, there, there seems to be a pushback in government and interestingly in certain right of centre secular media channels they seem to be more openly saying that the king does not have any clothes here yes i think there is i'm hoping there is a pushback because we've we've got this i mean real genuine pushback yeah. rather than the sort of defeated having their last cries yeah. um, i'm hoping there is a pushback i think there is because it's getting frightening now mm. um you know people are feeling they watched monitored mm. cameraed but also paul that the people that aren't christians are coming out uh, and saying and prominent people are saying this you know, something innate you know god-given yeah. conscience within that's saying this isn't well this i isn't think right. christians could be in for a shock because um, in many times, the clean-up of pornography and the clean-up of sort of restrictions has been led by the secular people. They've actually just said, we've had enough of this, we're passing the law, we're yeah. not going to have prostitutes on the streets of London. Yeah. And actually, they, many of the, there were great incidences of Wilberforce, of course, yeah, and Shaftesbury. Uh, Shaftesbury and stuff. Yeah. But very often, you know, it will be the secular people who will be brave and stand up and say, enough is enough. Wow. You know, so that you can be put to shame in historical epochs. It's still worth Britain. praying for those in authority. <laughs> there is. Us, I mean, I, th I think, says. yes, there are. I mean, we've, we've got a, we've, we've got a, we, we are doing a whirlwind of sort of multiple damaging social structures. There's not, I mean, you almost look back on the Thatcher era. I mean, her big concern was something like trade unions. And we yeah. wish we had something as simple as that now, you know, yes. it's, yeah. It's, it's, it's on a number of fronts now. Mm. Um, so, um, I, I, and the rapidity of it. I know it's a very short interview, so we're covering a lot yeah, 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 yeah. 
but um, uh, in Thatcher's era, you had Section 28. So yeah. well, that is a distant memory now. It is and a distant Anyone memory. who would even say the slightest thing in favour of, of safeguarding uh, using Section 28 would be shouted out. No, no, I mean I, I, I mean, I took this argument from a very famous academic, but I remember when I was doing one of my cases on Christians and sexual orientation, I used to sort of appeal back, we used to have these things called the Devlin Hart r debates and, you know, the Wolfson report on homosexuality, whether it should be legalized and people should be private lives in the state. And I would take straight from the, the, Wolf, the Wolfson report, the, yeah. the arguments they use for Christians, yeah. and I would say the Christian is now pleading for liberal tolerance, yes. granted in the early 60s and late 50s to the, the homosexuals, yeah. the Christians are seeking the same benefits yes. now. Yeah. And I saw the ironic. Ironic. And I saw the sort of, you know, judges looking. Well, one, I remember I said it once in this bench of the Court of Appeal, and two of them looked as if death had warmed them up. And that wasn't a very funny joke. And the third burst out laughing. Yeah. Interesting laugh, yeah. the one that laughed was my dissent and yeah. came with me in the final judgment. Yeah. But no, anyway, it is, it, it's, we just need wisdom, don't we? So cri cri the advice to Christians today is what, Paul? I think the advice to Christians today is, I know it's going to sound, you've got to believe in the Word. The Word is actually a book of hope. And I think we get overwhelmed by the, our personal circumstances, which, which feed into the sort of wider societal circumstances. And you, you've just got to step back. And as my... So we've got to have, you know, it is hopeful. We can change it. We can win. Mm. And I think God depends on us. I mean, I sometimes wonder, bluntly, maybe there was some Christian meant to shoot Hitler and lost his bottle and didn't yeah. do it or meant to have done something. Mm. And, you know, and I also said, I, I remind my, my, you know, I remember came in out very despondent, some great Christian case some court of appeal judge. They used to always shout at me, you know, it's, I've never heard such a flagrant abuse of the court processes, Mr. <laughs> Diamond. Or one judge called me a travesty of reality, um, which I was very proud of, you know, yes. I was like, I'd like to, my arguments were a travesty of reality. But, um, you know, I came out sort of, you know, moaning to my dad as a sort of probably my 30s, whatever it was. And my father, you know, I remember, well, you know, talking about boy, you know, yes. you know, when That's you had my dad as well. Yeah. When you had a choice between Stalin and Hitler as best mates, yeah. both socialists, by the way, people forget mm -hmm. Hitler as a socialist. One was an international socialist, one was a national socialist. Yeah. Um, yeah. America staying neutral, mm -hmm. letting Britain bleed. I mean, it was, my dad was in the RAF, and you know what the RAF was like, they would be sort of had about one runway left at one point. Um, it was, it was, desperate. it was, yeah, my dad actually I remember C.S. Lewis, yeah. you know, wrote during the pandemic, you know, yeah, basically man up. Like yeah. I say wrote, you know, they found an old quote of his that, you know, the smallest microbe could kill you. Yeah, yeah. You know, and he was writing that from when that I think he was countering the fear of the nuclear age. But he said, look, we've been living precarious existence. For well, I think I think that's part of the secular sort of religion. I mean, apart from human rights and laws, that we're all going to die. I mean, I, I lose track how many there was this, there was this illness in about 2013 from Africa yeah. and Ebola. Ebola. And we've got yeah. global warming and we've got you know, sun burning through on this, then we had global winters. I mean, they haven't quite made their mind no. up, but they, they, we're all going to die. That's yes. all they know. But yeah. maybe in about 20 million years, but we're all yeah. going to die. And yeah. I think as, as and we, it's, it's, so yeah. the children, the next generation are susceptible to that. So there is a great fear among the young. Yeah. I, you know, with Greta Thunberg and others, you know, there, there's a genuine fear out there. I, I know. I, I think for people in our generation, we just can't take it seriously. You know? yeah. I mean, I, I, I know it's, I'm going to put my foot in it. I, I heard yesterday that sort of June was the hottest month just June. Yeah. Absolute twaddle. It was freezing that month and yeah. maybe two Mr. good Diamond, days. This is a flagrant abuse of, you know, yeah. well, of, actually, of, of our hospitality in a Christian I've studio. had so many hysterical things. There was, uh, there was one case many years ago about this um, chap who... Uh, 
I've, I've just these little stories and there's this chap didn't want to work Sunday's big Sunday working case and he went we went up to the Court of Appeal anyway the, the, all the journalists I used to be very good at sort of self-publicizing so the, the back rows were packed with journalists and so I do my usual theatrical performance which I, I got very skilled at, you know, for the s courtesy of the mass media. And um, the judge just interrupted me and just looked at my client and went, you didn't want to work Sundays. Tell me where, where in the Bible does it say you could be lazy, sit at home and do no work Why your colleagues have to, you tell me where in the Bible it says that. And at that moment, you know, when a judge, I've got lots of stories yeah. like that, but when a judge goes that crazy, I throw myself under the desk, you take your wig up and throw it over the top. <laughs> anyway, so you're sort of sitting there shaken. And um, anyway, of course, it, it probably is only about 30 seconds, but an outburst like that feels like about five minutes, pin drop. And then the client looked at the judge and went, um, the Ten Commandments, number four. And, Classic. you know, you know and the whole court collapsed in laughter, yes. all the journalists at the back. Classic. I mean, he did, not only did he not know the Ten Commandments, but keep the Sabbath day holy. So he goes, he goes number, and he did it in such a sort of dead tone way, sort yeah. of. Uh, the Ten Commandments, yes. number four. <laughs> and we never had a peep out that judge for the oh, rest of the case. It's rather amazing. pleasant. Amazing. Yeah. You're making me, uh, you know, it's reminiscent of Witness for the Prosecution with Charles Lawton. <laughs> I'd love to be a fly on the wall yeah, yeah, yeah. and see some of these. But, um, yeah, yeah. you know, so it's not boring. Uh, we're in our last minute, Paul. So yeah. Yeah. Let's get some Christian testimony in at the end. Oh, uh, yeah. Well, no, it's been very exciting. Yeah. Um, I've met lots of obviously very interesting people in human mm. rights, Parliament, mm. Senate. Yeah. Um, had some great cases, yeah. um, you know, and one of, the, one, of, one of the greatest cases I had, no one will know about, but it was great fun. Yeah, that's wonderful. Paul, we're going to have to do another recording because we can't, we can't fit everything in. I haven't even talked about any of the individual cases. So I just want to say thank you so much. Uh, Paul Diamond, we've spoken a little bit about the rule of law. Appreciate it very much. Pleasure. Thank you so much. And uh, I've enjoyed it. And I always enjoy the fellowship with my dear brother, Paul. Uh, you've been watching Face to Face, the rule of law. Look forward to joining you next time we go face to face.